So welcome everyone. Um, so this is a webinar on uh, pollination and international development that's uh, hosted by the UK CDS. Um, and I'm just going to start with a few technical points about the, how the meeting will run. Um, so if you do, for a start, if you have any problems at any point, please email um, the, the address that's given on the, the page in front of you, events at ukcds.org.uk. Um, and what we're going to do, we're going to have um, start off with five speakers talking one after another, um, and we won't have any pauses for uh, questions in between to try and keep the meeting to schedule. Um, but if you do have any questions, which I hope you do, please email those in to that same email address, events at ukcds.org.uk. Um, and these will be collated during the event um, and will be incorporated into a structured discussion section at the end. So I'm just going to start with um, a little bit of background um, to myself and UKCDS um, and what this, is, uh, what this event is all about, and then I'll hand over to the first speaker. Um, before I do so, can I just um, ask everyone to please keep their microphones muted or their telephones muted and their cameras off um, for the duration of the event, unless you're speaking or you want to contribute in the discussion section, um, in which case you can turn your microphones on yourself um, and then please turn them off again afterwards. This will just help reduce some of the background noise. Um, okay, I'm just going to get started now. So I'm going to try making sure that I share my slides with you. Here we are. So, um, so just a brief introduction to myself. Um, my name's uh, Tom Timberlake, and I'm in my third year of a pollination ecology PhD at Bristol University, working with Professor Jane Mehmet. Um, but at the moment, I'm on a three-month work placement with the UK Collaborative on Development Sciences here in London. Um, so I've been running a project which um, looks at the relevance of pollination to international development, and this is in, embedded within my PhD. Um, and I've been communicating with um, a range of different stakeholders in this field, many of you who are here today, um, and um, trying to um, find out what the range of work that's being done in this field um, in, from an academic perspective, but also a development perspective um, and larger international organizations. I'm just trying to understand um, what's being done and how joined up these different efforts are. Um, and in line with the UK CDS's core aims, we're also thinking about how the UK can most effectively contribute to some of the ongoing efforts in this field. Um, so I'll now talk very briefly about what, who the UK CDS are um, and what we do. So, um, so the UK CDS is a, um, it's a partnership of 14 UK governmental departments and research funders, all of whom are working in international development. Um, these partners you can see on the screen, um, five of whom I hope are represented here today. Um, are sh so the Secretariat, um, which is a small coordinating group, bring all these partners together along with um, relevant individuals and organizations to help so to foster dialogue and collaboration between them with the ultimate aim of improving development outcomes. Um, and this webinar today will hopefully address some of these aims by bringing together many of you working in this field, um, allowing you to hear what's being done and discuss what more can be done, particularly by the UK, to improve development outcomes. Um, I'd like to point out there will also be a more detailed report published following this event, um, and I hope that some of the conversations started today um, can continue into the future and generate some positive outcomes, both for science um, and for development. So I'm just going to start with a bit of background on why this is all important. Um, Simon Potts was, uh, was going to cover some of this, but unfortunately was unable to make it. Um, but um, So the paper that's shown at the bottom, um, lead authored by him, is, um, is a much better um, summary of all of this, but I'm just going to um, provide a brief overview. So animal pollination, um, which is mostly performed by insects, but also by birds, bats, and various other organisms, is important for the reproduction and therefore the long-term survival of a great majority of wild flowering plants. Um, it's also really important for a large number of crop plants, uh, increasing their yield, their quality, and even the longevity of their products. Um, so, and, th and these benefits that um, pollination brings to the crop plants 
um, are valued at between 235 and 577 billion dollars every year. So it's a really substantial service. But aside from these very functional and monetary values, um, pollinators also have immense cultural value. So they act as a source of inspiration in, in art, music, and folklore. Um, and I think these values really can't be overlooked. Um, so partly because of this, um, this great value that we place on pollinators, um, there was a, the evidence that has been emerging in the last couple of decades on some of the dramatic pollinator declines that uh, we've seen in various parts of the world have stimulated a great deal of international attention um, and also concern. So in the late 1990s, um, the Convention on Biological Diversity established its International Pollinator Initiative to address some of these concerns. And we're lucky enough to have Barbara Gemiel Heron with us today, who will talk to us a bit later about the work that she's done on this, because um, she was very influential in the, in the establishment of this initiative. Um, more recently, um, concern over pollinator, pollinator declines has featured in a lot of um, media around the world and stimulates a lot of high profile research. Um, and a lot of this research was brought together um, in 2016 in a very comprehensive report by the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Um, and and on their, in their report on pollinators, pollination and food production. Um, and here Ngo from the IFBES Secretariat who coordinated this report will talk to us in a moment about, about what this has achieved. Um, it's worth bearing in mind though that although there is a great deal of um, international attention on pollination science and our understanding of pollinators has grown enormously in recent years, by far the majority of this work has been done in the developed world, particularly um, North America and Western Europe, as this map shows, um, and very little in the developing world. And this strong regional knowledge bias is a, is a real concern because there's reason to believe that the consequences of pollinator decline uh, may be at least as serious in the developing world um, for a number of reasons which I'll now outline. So, First of all, declines in pollination services have the potential to, to really impact upon the income and the livelihoods of developing communities um, through reducing their crop yields. So over two billion people in, in developing countries are smallholder farmers, producing about half of the world's food. Um, and these people are he often heavily reliant upon pollinators without necessarily knowing it. Um, Various studies have shown that already in the developing world, some crops are experiencing a loss of potential yield as a result of insufficient pollination. Um, and some of the most valuable cash crops that are grown around the world, such as coffee, cocoa, cashew nuts, tequila, um, are really pollinator dependent crops and almost exclusively grown in developing countries. Um, and these sort of crops provide people with a really important source of income. For example, cocoa represents about 13% of Ivory Coast's GDP. Um, and what makes all of this even more concerning is that our reliance on pollinator dependent crops has actually increased fourfold in the last 50 years and continues to increase. Um, and most of this increase comes from um, developing countries which grow a lot of these sorts of crops. So this highlights the real sort of um, particular vulnerability of some of these developing countries. Um, and while we in the developed world um, generally have the flexibility and the financial support to buffer some of these effects of pollinator declines, perhaps by changing our farming practices or what we eat to, to accommodate the changes, um, those in the developing world just can't afford to do this. They don't have those support systems in place. Um, and this really increases their vulnerability. Um, so with a decline in pollination services, um, not only would calorie intake and income um, of communities fall, but the balance of people's diets is likely to shift substantially. So some of the most nutritionally important food groups, such as fruits, nuts, seeds, and vegetables, um, these are also some of the most pollinator-dependent crops. Um, and severe pollination declines are therefore predicted to cause many millions of people around the world, and particularly in developing countries who rely on these foods, to become um, deficient in important micronutrients. And again, most communities uh, don't have the, in developing countries, don't have the ability to buffer these, these effects by just shifting their diets like we might do in the West. Um, and Sam Myers from Harvard University, has, he's led a lot of the work on this topic um, and we're lucky enough to have him here today and he'll talk to us a bit later about a lot more of the detail of these, these studies. 
So in addition to the benefits derived through crop pollination, um, bees also provide um, really valuable products, or some bees do, such as honey and beeswax. And these can generate really important supplementary income for communities in developing countries. Um, and it's worth noting that it's not just honeybees that, that uh, have this asset, also certain stingless bees are harvested for their, their honey. Um, and this can have really important social and cultural benefits associated with it. And Janet, Janet Lawari from uh, Bees for Development will talk a lot more about this later, because um, their organization does a lot of work around the world on, on promoting sustainable beekeeping. So we know that pollination is important um, in the developing world, but why should we be worried about it? And why specifically in the developing world? So one of the main issues with thinking about pollination in, in this part of the world is that we just, we just don't have enough baseline data or monitoring programs to be able to evaluate the population trends. Um, so we, we just don't know what's happening to pollinators in these areas often. But from localized studies and extrapolations from trends in the developed world, where we see many of the same threats, um, it's very likely that pollinator populations are also declining in these developing regions, and will certainly do so in the future as population, human populations rapidly grow and agriculture intensifies. Um, already there's a, there's a rapid loss of natural habitat that we're seeing around the developing world, and an increased use of chemical inputs such as pesticides and fertilizers which are often less regulated um, than they are currently in the, in the developed world. Um, and because of the regional knowledge bias in pollination science that I mentioned earlier, um, it's a lot more difficult to address some of these concerns in the developing world. But to start, to start addressing some of them, these concerns, um, what is really urgently needed is just more information on various aspects of, of pollinator biology, um, such as their population trends, the distribution and factors that could be driving their decline in the developing world. Um, there's also a really strong need to start building knowledge and capacity in the taxonomy of pollinators, particularly in Africa, um, to act as a sort of baseline bank of knowledge so that more effective studies can be conducted on them um, that actually look at specific species rather than just functional groups. Um, and Mary Gukungu from the Natural, National Museums of Kenya, um, she's done a lot of work on building capacity in pollination taxonomy. Um, and we'll hopefully talk to us about this later. We also have Colonel Eardley here, who I think will we'll hopefully talk in the discussion section about some of the, the work done on, on pollination taxonomy. Um, so as well as all this, we also need to better understand the degree of dependence upon pollinators in the developing world. So which crops are most reliant? Um, how widespread are pollination deficits? Um, and why, what's causing these deficits? And also, how can we most effectively manage the services that the pollinators provide in these regions? So this will all require a great deal of research and capacity building, which obviously takes a lot of time. But in the meantime, it's really important to learn the lessons that we can from, from existing work that's been done and use it straight away to inform national policy so that pollinators can start being safeguarded sort of as soon as possible. So this brings us on to what um, a country like the UK can contribute to this knowledge generation and capacity building. And as part of what um, an organization like the UK CDS tries to think about. Um, so for a start, we have a, we have a great deal of scientific expertise in this country. Uh, the UK is the second largest contributor to pollination science papers after the US. Um, but at the moment, only a very small proportion of these studies have any relationship to a developing country uh, or to international development more broadly. Um, there's therefore a lot of scope to expand this research and apply some of this, this scientific expertise to other parts of the world through international collaborations and funding, which can both help to build capacity as well. Um, UK Darwin, Darwin Initiative projects, which link together biodiversity research with development goals and capacity building, are a really good example of, of how this, this sort of framework can be achieved. So on the topic of funding, um, I'd just like to show you this figure of global funding for pollination science. Um, so the UK is the second largest funder by quite a long way after the, the, U the US. Um, but again, the sum of the sum that the UK contributes, um, only a very small proportion, about 6%, is estimated to involve work in developing countries or have any direct relevance to international development. 
Um, and I think this highlights an area in which the UK could really expand its focus. So with, particularly with the recent changes in the UK's science funding landscape and a lot more funding available to universities through, the, through our overseas development budget, there's likely to be a shift in emphasis towards research that genuinely contributes towards international development. Um, and I think with the clear relevance of pollination and agroecology more generally to addressing the UN's sustainable development goals, um, this seems like a very valid field of research to fit into this new funding landscape. So we can discuss some of these issues later in the discussion section. Um, and please can I remind you to, to email in any questions you have to, to the um, address events at ukcds.org.uk. But for now, I'd like to hand over to Barbara um, Gemiel Heron. So Barbara, perhaps you could start getting your, your screen sharing ready. Um, okay. So, uh, okay, so your sharing. microphone's on. Um, if you... If you start getting your screen sharing ready with your PowerPoint, I'll just introduce you. Um, so Barbara um, has lived and worked in Africa for the last um, 25 years, and she's been really at the forefront of bringing pollen topics like pollination and agroecology to the kind of heart of the, the FAO's agenda um, while she, well, through her work with, with them. Um, she was also very instrumental in developing the original um, uh, International Pollinator Initiative through the Convention on Biological Diversity. And she continues to work with them to this day on developing an updated strategy, um, which, is, which will be carried out by the FAO. Um, so I'm hoping she'll talk to us a bit about some of this work and um, pollination in the developing world more generally. So I'm gonna turn off my camera now and hopefully Barbara, you're able to share your screen. Yes, I've put my screen on, so tell me if that's working. Let me just... Um, I can't see it at the moment. Yes. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. We'll just give it a moment. Okay. If you just, there's a, um, a panel on your right which says share screen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have done that. Okay, sorry. I'll, can you see it now? No, I'm afraid not. If, if, you, hmm. can't, if you continue not to be able to see, I, I've got your slides here which I can show, but just, just okay. have one more try. Um, so if you click share yeah, screen. I'll try it again. Yeah. And it says screen one, start sharing. You are sharing your screen, is what it tells me. Oh, that looks right. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So if you just and share. I'll go back here. Yep. And into your PowerPoint. Okay. Perfect. Is that so? Is that okay? Yep. Okay. Good. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. And I'm I'm very happy to be here and speak. It's a really really great topic. So I'll just um go through this and, and try to give you some initial background on the history because I think what Tom was saying is that we have a lot of experience that can be built upon and it would be really good to, I think everybody's um, reconsidering right now where we should go next with pollination. So this is a really good time to take stock of where we've been in the past. And just a br brief history that in 1996, the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity developed a, a multi-year program of work on bringing in agricultural biodiversity into the convention where it wasn't when it was originally um, negotiated. And this was extremely important to many developing countries in particular. So at the third meeting of the Conference of Parties, they developed a program of work on agricultural biodiversity and acknowledged that it's very fundamental to, to issues of food security. And they said specifically at this point that agricultural biodiversity was not simply genetic resources, that it, they specifically mentioned soil biodiversity and pollinators in this initial um, uh, development of a program of work on agricultural biodiversity. And then in 2000, um, the Conference of Parties established the International Initiative for the Conservation and Sustainable Use of Pollinators, which we call informally the International Pollinators Initiative. Barbara, I can't, um, we can't hear your um, sound anymore. Is your audio definitely still on? Um, so Barbara, just hold on a moment because we can't hear your sound. So you cut out in your slide which started with in 2000. Okay. Oh, there um, you are, you're back, you're back. I'm back, okay. My, okay. The connection is not terribly good here, so tell me, if you do not hear me and, and we'll try to figure something out. Okay, we'll do. Okay, 
Yeah, okay. So in 2000, um, the Conference of Parties requested the development of a plan of action inviting food and agriculture organization to facilitate and coordinate the initiative, cooperating with other relevant organizations. And a plan was prepared by FAO and the CBD at that time. This is, <clears throat> that was then 18 years ago, so we're at this point again where we've been implementing this plan of action for the last, say, 15 years, and now it's requested that we, um, that it be revised and updated. So to understand what, what has been done, the key objectives in this first phase of the IPI was to, the, this was adopted by the parties to the Convention on Biodiversity, so it's been negotiated among countries, that the um, objectives were to monitor pollinator decline, address taxonomic impediments, assess economic values of pollination and the impact of, of declines, and promote conservation, restoration, and sustainable use of pollinator diversity in agriculture and related ecosystems. So quite a lot of um, stress on gathering just initial information to understand where we are. So to achieve these objectives, the IPI was structured around four elements of assessment, adaptive management, capacity building, and mainstreaming. And I think it's very important to, to really stress that the International Pollinator Initiative has always been meant to be not simply the work of FAO or the CBD, but to, to comprise the work and the contribution of many people and organizations around the world concerned with the fate of pollinators. And certainly over the last 18 years, there's been a real, so many groups have been galvanized to undertake work on pollinators. Uh, we've, FAO has always tried to gather information on this and report it back to the CBD. But it should always be seen as not simply uh, centered in, in FAO, but the work of people all around the world. So, but in any case, corresponding to the structure of the plan of action, FAO was able to submit and receive funding for a global environmental facility project, the Global Pollination Project, that, that was implemented from 2009 to 2015. And uh, to speak a bit about, the, about what was carried on under, the, under this project, um, there were national pollination projects established in seven countries, Brazil, Ghana, India, Kenya, Nepal, Pakistan, and South Africa. And through the work on the ground in these countries, there were 22 crop-focused sites where research, carrying, developing protocols, research protocols, carrying out training, um, applying the research on a multitude of crops. Uh, I've listed them here. For example, apples, cashew, mango, tomatoes, rape, sunflower, French bean, um, tree crops, row crops, we really tried to stress a diversity of crops and a diversity of agroecosystems. And then work on awareness raising policy in the country. Uh, so I'm, I will just, I want to go over this quickly because you have a lot of speakers and not a lot of time. And I, you know, I'm very happy to share the, um, the PowerPoint with people, so I won't go in, in detail into all what was carried out. But in addition to the work in each one of the um, seven countries, it was possible to carry out work collaborating with these countries to have certain global outputs, which I think was a, a strength of the project. And I just here among, in the assessment um, element of, of the project, I just will go in a little bit of detail to talk about this um, opportunity that we had to develop a methodology on crop pollination deficits. So we worked with, um, with researchers at, at, um, in France and in Brazil to develop a protocol for assessing and detecting pollination deficits in crops. So this is just the first step to, to verify that there are deficits and what, to what extent do we have deficits. Uh, we then worked out circumstances such as sort of somewhat commercial develop, um, growth of runner beans in Kenya where just the absence of a pollinator at one point in the, on the uh, flower can result in these sickle-shaped pods which have no commercial value. Uh, and then equally um, in subsistence agriculture in, in the Himalayas in India, the importance of mustard greens and to what extent they were suffering from a pollination deficit. So through that, I'm just because it's, I think it's interesting if you have people looking at funding opportunities, when we had the project then we had the opportunity of having it, the Jeff really stresses the ability to catalyze additional funding. And so after we had done this in the seven project countries, the government of Norway came to us and said, this would be really interesting as an input into the IPBES assessment. Could you extend it to several other countries? So we were able to extend it to, for example, China, Argentina, Zimbabwe, and then bring all the researchers from those countries together with their results to carry out a meta-analysis, which 
developed a much more robust um, outcome than simply studies in 11 different countries. And as a result of this, we had a very interesting finding that, that small smallholder, small farms are able to um, address their pollination deficits through biodiversity um, much more easily than, than larger farms. And this ended up to be a, a science article, which I think many of the researchers were um, on their own would not have been able to reach that level, but working together, it was possible to have that sort of outcome. So the other element on adaptive management, um, again, we, we worked on really trying to address pesticide issues primarily. And uh, we worked with colleagues, again, this was a, a co-funding from the government of the Netherlands, working with colleagues at Wageningen University to develop a risk assessment of pesticides to pollinators. And accompanying that was a publication describing the vulnerability of different bee groups to, pollen, to pesticides. So we, um, we developed this publication that had different chapters on the different bee groups, looking at their life history cycles and how that really may affect their exposure to pesticides and what needs to be known as we develop management plans for them between um, carpenter bees, which nest in, in some sort of wood, versus leafcutter bees, which carry leaves back to their nest and are exposed to not just visiting flowers, but from, from bringing the material back to their nests. Um, so capacity building was the third element. Um, one of the things that we were able to do on this was to develop a training and then a manual accompanying the training on apple pollination. Just to say that this was also the strength of having a global project in that we had um, apples are grown in so many different environments around the world, as you can see in the map on the, on the left. And, and so we could, we could work with different people uh, looking at apple pollination in tropical conditions in Brazil, in mountainous conditions in Pakistan, um, in Canada, There's so many different places where we, we could bring together and, and pool information um, and see different approaches that, that people have in different parts of the country. Um, on the upper right is a, this innovative uh, hives that people have developed in, in India where they used to build space in their house for bees to actually nest in the walls of the house, an, a native honeybee. And um, that, now that they're not building houses like that anymore, they're developing these small hives that look like the houses and provide the same kind of insulation to the beehives. And equally, there's a, a concern with how you space different kinds of um, apple trees, the pollinizer and, and the, the, the main apple crop. Um, and people, there's certain recommendations from science, but our our farmers in, in northern India had different ideas about how to work the spacing to accommodate um, surfeit flies, which are very important in that region and don't fly very far. So, and then our last element was on main, <coughs> mainstreaming, which we took to mean both developing policy responses and increasing awareness. Um, so, yeah, the, I would say that this was the one that was the most difficult to get to, and I, maybe I'll bring that out a little bit later as we, we go forward. Uh, so the current status is that the outcomes of this project and the IPBES assessment have led to a really renew, a very strong renewed focus on pollination. The Convention on Biological Diversity in its last conference of parties has called for a new plan of action for the International Pollinator Initiative. This um, plan of action development is underway. They have an expert advisory committee an expert advisory meeting was held in November in Rome, uh, taking into consideration what we have learned and the outcomes of the IPBES assessment. The plan of action is being built on recommendations of the CBD responding to the IPBES assessment for actions on now this policies promoting pollinator-friendly habitats and sustainable agroecosystems and pollinator husbandry reduce risks from law, habitat loss, pathogens, invasives, pesticides, and climate change, increase awareness, share knowledge, and improve valuation tools for decision making, and foster research assessment and monitoring. So this plan of action for the next 10 years will be presented to the next SUBSTA, the subsidiary body for science, technology, and technical advice of the Convention on Biodiversity, their upcoming meeting in April 2018. Um, so key considerations that we've been discussing for this next phase have been that over the last 15, 18 years, large advances have been made on expanding the knowledge base. A lot of the emphasis has gone into understanding just the basic, basic understanding of, of how pollinators are important. Um, so I think we, ha we have a 
forward right now. And in this next phase, the management and implementation of pollinator-friendly practices, how a difference can be made on the ground is really important to focus on, and also on developing enabling policy. So I think both of these need to be the central focus going forward. But lessons learned from the past is that a standalone pollination f focus is not the most effective way to go. Farmers never manage for pollination alone. They manage the whole agroecosystem. And nor do policymakers manage for pollination alone. We have had a couple of countries which have adopted a pollinator um, policy. And I think, I think Ireland is one country that has, and Nepal has an agricultural biodiversity policy with a specific focus on pollinators. But I think it's unlikely that we're really aiming for pollinator policy as a standalone policy. I think it needs to be worked into a larger scope of how we need to change agriculture to make it pollinator friendly. So I think there's a very broad need to focus on and to consider pollination as a component of a broader suite of agroecological principles, which all need to be tackled together. Um, and my personal reflections would be that for future funding priorities, that in the past we have had a whole generation of extension workers and farmers who have been trained in more green revolution, high input pro approaches, which have not worked in many contexts. And what is needed right now is to, is to train up a new cohort of agroecological researchers and extension workers to take forward a new wave of sustainable agriculture in the developing world and the developed world alike. I think there's a lot of learning that can be done collaboratively because the need is, is in both the developing world and the developed world. And I do think that um, there could be really great scope for developing networks and animating networks that, that make researchers who are researching these areas that can feel a little bit um, isolated sometimes to make them feel like a part of a growing uh, initiative and to be working together across countries. And we've certainly seen that in the early project and what we were able to do with pollination deficits and sharing information, for example, on apple pollination. I would also say that what remains missing is a clear framework for incorporating pollinator conservation and agroecological pr principles into policy on multiple levels. I think it's very important on, from local levels to national to global levels. So we, we, we better, oh, you're done, that's right. Yeah, okay, so I, that's, I, thank, thank you. And, thank, thank you very much, Barbara, and amazingly, you, uh, you're, from, you're phoning in from California and I believe got up at 6 a.m. to do this, so thank you very much for that. Really you're welcome. Yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna move on to um, Hien now. Um, so Hien, if you would like to start sharing your screen. Um, so I'll just quickly introduce you. So Hien Go is um, a pollination ecologist, um, but she's also the coordinator of the International Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services um, report on pollinators. Um, so she's been working on that the last two years and brought together an amazing body of work um, along with various co-authors. So um, hopefully Hien will talk to us about that today and, and the um, amazing impacts that this report has had around the world, particularly on policy. So, uh, Hien, oh, there you are, wonderful. Yeah. Can you see my screen okay? And can you hear me okay? I, I can, yeah, that looks great. Okay, thanks, Perfect. Tom. I want to say good afternoon to everyone that's on this call. Uh, thank you to the UK CDS and Tom for arranging this webinar, I think it's great. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about IPES um, and what it is and what we've done in the in in the last few years. Um, as Tom said, I was the technical support person supporting the IPES pollination assessment. IPES is short for the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. As you can see on the screen, broadly the objective is to provide policy relevant knowledge on biodiversity and ecosystem services to inform decision making. Currently we have 128 member countries uh, with Paraguay being the most recent addition to uh, our, our members. Uh, we're led by Anne Larry Goddery, who's our executive secretary and we're currently chaired by Sir Robert Watson. Um, we're right now in the first work program of IPBES, which is extended until uh, 2018, but kind of spills into 2019. Um, I'm calling from Bonn, Germany, where our secretariat is based. So the IPBES work program, 
as I just said, is, is in its first phase, and the governments and MEAs submitted requests relating to biodiversity and ecosystem services in order to build, really, the first elements of the first work program. The platform, IFBES, had a procedure for receiving and prioritizing these uh, inputs and requests, and pollinators, pollination, and food production was the first one governments and MEAs alike identified as, as a priority item, and it was a focused theme that could easily be delivered by um, it best. When I say easily, I'll put that in quotes. And um, it was supposed to be built on an existing evidence base that was already there and growing. So those elements needed to have happened to be approved for the first thematic assessment. So um, we were building on the work that Barbara has just uh, presented on, and we continued during the pollination assessment regarding pollinators and pollination. So in 2013, at ICBES 2, at the end of 2013, uh, the assessment was approved for undertaking based on its scoping document, and it was originally coined as a fast-track thematic assessment, but that fast-track part was dropped as the assessment went through all of the rounds of review with governments and experts. So it was just uh, the first thematic deliverable from IPBES. So as I said, it was approved in late 2013 with the first authors meeting in 2014, and then the, the final approval in February slash March of 2016 in Kuala Lumpur. It's outlined as a two-year process, but it was much shorter and faster than that. Again, it was one of these first landmark uh, outputs of IPBES, and it was incredibly led by two co-chairs, uh, Simon Potts and Vera Imperatriz Fonseca, um, supported by an amazing group of experts that were globally recognized for, for their work in pollination and pollination services, 19 coordinating lead authors, 41 lead authors, 14 review editors, and a whole army of contributing authors. We have a few of the authors I see online today, so that's good. So what happened after two years of work was uh, we had compiled this, this large assessment and linked to it was a shorter 30-page, uh, approximate 30-page uh, summary for policymakers, which was brought for approval um, in 2016 with 126 member countries nego negotiating the text of the SPM line by line. Uh, it was approved, and as a result of its approval, the underlying assessment of six chapters and, and over 500 pages was also accepted. This negotiation took uh, 19 hours for 30 pages, and 23 key messages were approved. So what were the achievements after the approval of the SPM? There's I've grouped them into three kind of broader categories, and I'll just quickly glean the first two categories and then focus more on the policy outreach. Um, the first one would be media and public outreach. So this is a bit of an outdated statistic, but uh, but it just goes to show that after the approval of the summary for policymakers at IPBES 4 in Kuala Lumpur, the media campaign linked to this pollination assessment report um, generated over 1,400 online news articles and also in traditional media, and it um, it was through the 18 top international news wires with coverage in 28 languages in 81 countries, and the top news wires included Reuters, Bloomberg, Le Monde, Associated Press, etc. The science outreach was great. Um, these are six of the uh, publications that stemmed from the pollination assessment report with more in the pipeline. And as you can see, we, we really aim for higher impact journals um, to showcase some of the key findings of the pollination assessment report. I'll draw your attention to uh, Lynn Dix's um, publication in Science, which she did with a subgroup of experts from the pollination assessment that were about 10 policy for pollinators. The 10 policies um, they wanted to outline within that article are are things that governments should seriously consider um, to protect pollinators and secure pollination services. And again, with policy outreach, as, as Barbara mentioned uh, briefly in her presentation as well, 
at the Convention on Biological Diversity 13th meeting of the Conference of the Parties in Cancun in late December of 2016, adoption uh, 1315 were the implications of the IPBES report um, to the convention in which all parties of the convention, 196 countries, uh, welcomed the IPBES SPM and it endorsed its key messages. And those key messages are really reflected um, under the broad um, groupings that are mirrored within uh, Lynn's paper that I had just previously showed you, promoting pollinator-friendly habitats, improving the management of pollinators, reducing risks from pesticides, enabling policies and activities, and finally, research, monitoring, and assessment. At the same time, during the COP, um, the Netherlands, the COP, sorry, the Conference of the Parties of the CBD, um, in Cancun, the Netherlands announced um, that there would be a new declaration um, and there was a coalition of the willing on pollinators formed with 13 original signatory countries. And if you hit their website, Ethiopia has been the, the, the last one to sign um, on July 2017, but they will be probably signing more member countries and this coalition of the willing on pollinators will probably start to grow as well. Uh, the, the Netherlands has established, uh, with support from the Netherlands, has established a secretariat on the Coalition of the Willing, which I'll just show there with uh, the website for more information. So the question really is, what's next? And before I talk a little bit about what's next, I'll show um, you a slide of these. This is a slide that I... Um, took from Simon Potts. It's the national initiatives that have been established or currently are in development. So as you can see, there's a lot of them throughout um, many, many countries uh, and also ones that are currently being established national pollinator initiatives and strategies. I see Pippa's also participating in this call and she was part of this BestNet trialogue on pollinators and pollination. Um, BestNet is the Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Network. Um, it's a capacity building network of networks that promotes really dialogue between many different actors in science policy and practice for more effective management of these biodiversity and ecosystem services. So BestNet is hosted through UNDP and this is the way it contributes to capacity building work of IPBES. Last October, um, we had a BestNet trialogue from 50 um, in Sarajevo, and there's 52 stakeholders from five different countries in Eastern Europe. And it was, a, it was a dialogue between policy, science, and practice focusing on specific policy questions at the national and regional levels. Um, so this is quite important because of what Barbara has just presented about policy-relevant information, but on multiple scales. So the objective of the dialogues were really to raise awareness of the key findings for IPBES, uh, sharing of knowledge across these different sectors and across these different countries, really, um, identifying regionally and nationally relevant risks and opportunities, and then generating a commitment through which they've published online and called an action document, and, and that's available if you're part of the BestNet community. And so finally, you know, so what's next? I'm happy to report. I'm really excited. Um, I don't know if that's conveyed properly, but the UN General Assembly has a resolution declaring World Bee Day. Um, this is May 20th, so it's, it's an opportunity on top of the already existing pollinator weeks for really campaigns about awareness regarding pollinators and pollination. That's quite exciting for me. Um, the capacity building and mainstreaming work. Again, I mentioned a little bit about the best net trialogues because there will be more trialogues to come and more dialogues to come uh, regarding these different stakeholders uh, on the topic of pollinators and pollination. There's more initiatives. There's, there's, there's ones in the pipeline, which I showed you from that slide that I took from Simon. They're currently being developed. There's an exciting European Pollinator Initiative. I have the website up there. The EU Pollinator Initiative is in its first phase of development, and right now it's going through an open public consultation to ensure that all stakeholders um, have an opportunity to express their views and provide feedback on what they think is important, excuse me, on pollinators and pollination. And then finally, the second phase of the International Pollinator Initiative, which Barbara has already presented on. 
So thank you very much, Tom. Uh, thank that's the end wonderful. of the Thank you, Ian. That's that was really really interesting. Um, and I yeah, it's so nice to hear from the IPES about how this has all been brought together. Um, I we're running a little bit behind time, but I think we we haven't got one speaker, so that's not too much of a problem. But uh, hopefully we'll uh, get back onto schedule. So um, I'd just like to bring the next speaker, which is um, Sam. So Sam Isaac, would you like to start getting your? Oh, there we are. I'm just going to quickly introduce you. Just hold on a second. Um, Right, hopefully you can all see that. Um, so Sam, Sam Mize is um, representing the very important field of health science, um, which I don't, which I think you're alone today in the health science field, but that's really um, it's fantastic to have you here. So Sam is um, principal research scientist at um, Harvard's Chan School of Public Health, and he's also director of the Planetary Health Alliance, which looks at the ways in which the changing environment is affecting human health. Um, and this includes a topic he's going to talk to us about today, which is very relevant. Um, that's the ways in which pollinator declines are likely to impact upon human health. So, Sam, hope I'll hand over to you now. Um, Perfect. Yeah, can you can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you all. Uh, uh, thanks to Tom and the UK CDS for organizing uh, such an interesting and really important meeting, and I'm really thrilled to be included uh, and have a chance to tell you a little bit about our work on pollination services and human health. Uh, the context uh, for our work was uh, that there were a handful of papers out there in the literature that had been uh, showing that uh, large fractions of the uh, calories in the global diet uh, and then another paper showing large uh, fractions of the micronutrients in the human diet came from uh, crops that depended on pollinators. And um, what was sort of a, a hole in the literature was going from that sort of global level assessment to actually analyzing dietary data for particular populations to try to understand what uh, reductions in pollination services might mean for uh, particular uh, nutritional outcomes. And so we uh, decided to try to fill that hole. We started with sort of a pilot study where we looked at um, dietary data that we had for populations in uh, Zambia, Uganda, Mozambique, and Bangladesh. And we looked at what would happen to micronutrient deficiencies if uh, pollinator services uh, declined precipitously in those countries. And uh, we really uh, honed in on vitamin A and folate as the two uh, deficiencies that were most important and are also very, very important from a human health uh, standpoint. And what we learned from that first study was essentially that um, pollinator, you know, the health impacts of pollinator declines really depend on a population meeting uh, two conditions. The first <clears throat> condition is that the population has to be relatively near uh, a threshold of nutrient insufficiency uh, for the nutrient of interest. And the second criteria is that they have to get important amounts of those nutrients uh, from pollinator-dependent crops. And so, for example, in Bangladesh, uh, there were actually important reductions in vitamin A as a result of pollinator declines, but the baseline intake of vitamin A was so low that almost everybody was already deficient and it didn't make a big difference. In Zambia, we found the opposite, which was that the intake was so high that the shift to the left of uh, reduced intake of vitamin A didn't really make a difference because still everybody was getting enough, whereas in Mozambique and Uganda, uh, people were relatively close uh, to the threshold of sufficient intake, and so that shift to the left actually had large implications in terms of population level vitamin A deficiency. So we sort of took those lessons that we learned, uh, and then we took a new development that had occurred while we were doing our research, which was that the global burden of disease calculations came out from 2012. And um, one of the new findings in the global burden of disease calculations was that they're very significant uh, global burdens of disease from inadequate intake of certain food groups. So not specific to a micronutrient, but that inadequate intake of fruits, vegetables, and nuts and seeds 
uh, were really high on the list of uh, global causes of morbidity and mortality, mostly from non-communicable diseases, things like heart disease, uh, stroke, uh, diabetes, and certain cancers. And so we wanted to capture uh, those outcomes as well. And so we designed a study, uh, and it really was kind of a combination of different data sources. So the first thing that you need to know to do this kind of study is what people are eating and what the nutrient content of each of those foods is. And it turns out that we have really poor global uh, nationally representative data uh, for what people are eating and what's in it. We ended up actually having to build a global database called the Global Expanded Nutrient Supply Database, which we then used uh, for the rest of the analysis. And that essentially gives us estimates of per capita intake of 225 foods uh, for the populations of 152 countries with the nutrient content of each one of those foods for 23 different nutrients. We combined that data with data on the pollinator dependence of each food crop, and then we ran uh, some different scenarios of pollinator declines uh, at the global scale uh, and looked at five different nutritional outcomes. And the five outcomes were inadequate intake of vitamin A, inadequate intake of folate, and then insufficient intake of fruits, vegetables, and nuts and seeds. And we use those because we have a way of estimating the burden of disease from each one of those outcomes so that we could actually bring them together to quantify the total burden of disease that we would experience as a result of loss of pollination services, uh, both globally and in each one of the countries we're looking at. And the final question we were interested in looking at was how much of the burden of disease that we were calculating resulted from declines of pollinators within that country, what we called sort of indigenous pollinator declines, as opposed to exogenous declines in trade partner countries. And we thought that was important to know from the standpoint of policy so that each country had a sense of how important its own pollinator populations were for maintaining its nutritional health. So what we found um, here, you can see the, the graph on the top, uh, or the map on the top, is essentially showing a burden of disease uh, by uh, region. And it's not an unfamiliar story for all of you in the development world that um, you know, people in uh, the lower income countries tend to be at the highest risk. And so this is looking at increased risk of um, malnutrition or micronutrient deficiency and associated infectious disease uh, from things like vitamin A deficiency. But what was more surprising to us was the uh, map on the bottom, which actually shows higher levels of burden of disease. And this time you're seeing large burdens of disease in more developed countries, particularly uh, across Eastern Europe, uh, the former Soviet Republic. Uh, and the reason for that is that the inadequate intake of these food groups is increasing the risk of non-communicable diseases, and the underlying risk of those non-communicable diseases is higher <clears throat> in those more developed country settings. And so that was interesting to us. Um, so overall, uh, what we found was that uh, we could expect to see with, with total pollinator collapse, uh, and again, these were scenarios, um, we could expect to see an additional uh, 70 or so million people pushed into vitamin A deficiency, uh, over 150 million people pushed into folate deficiency, and overall, um, a complete loss of pollinator services would lead to around 1.4 million uh, excess deaths uh, annually. One of the interesting parts of this was that when we looked at that question of um, how much of that burden of disease results from uh, indigenous pollinator declines, uh, we were surprised, actually, that most of it, 82 percent of uh, the disability-adjusted life years lost, um, occurred uh, as a result of indigenous pollinator declines. And we actually published in The Lancet, um, in this paper, uh, a supplemental table in which we list all of the 152 countries and the burden of disease that we would anticipate as a result of pollinator declines globally 
but also of pollinator declines within that country in the hopes that that is a useful policy tool so that uh, policymakers within a country can understand uh, what's at stake in terms of their uh, maintaining pollination services for their own uh, populations. And we'd really, you know, as you all know and are trying to address in this, in this call, uh, we don't know enough about uh, the state of pollination services at national levels in lower income countries or, or most countries around the world. Um, but as we start to understand the trend, we would, based on the models that we've developed, be in a position to actually start calculating how those trends will play out in terms of health impacts at the uh, national level. And that's something we're interested in doing as we get more access to good quality data on what's actually happening to pollination services. In terms of future needs, I guess the one thing I would say to this community is that um, I see this whole uh, set of questions around health impacts of pollinator declines as part of a larger set of questions around um, large-scale environmental change. And there are lots of ways, as you all know, that we're changing the biophysical conditions within which our food production system needs to function. And we do research, for example, on how rising carbon dioxide levels are reducing the nutrient content of staple foods, on how fisheries declines are affecting nutritional outcomes, on loss of bush meat in the diet and what that means for micronutrient insufficiency. So there are many different ways that we're altering quality and quantity of foods produced. And at the core of any analysis, trying to understand who is vulnerable to those changes and what we can do to reduce those vulnerabilities and to, um, to identify which populations are at risk, at the heart of any of those analyses is data on what people are actually eating and what the nutrient content of those foods is. And that data is really poor quality. And so we would love to be doing you know, a lot more work with colleagues around the world to actually create a global nutritional atlas that's essentially a compendium um, and it's, it's building from the genus database we've already constructed of much higher quality data of what the world is eating and that would allow us to understand the vulnerabilities uh, to things like uh, pollinator decline. So let me stop with that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sam. That that's really fascinating, and um, it's really nice to bring in that um, the health link. Um, I believe that Lucas um, from Our Planet, Our Health Welcome Trust is also here today, and they they're doing some um, similar work on on the way that environmental change is affecting human health. Um, so it's really nice to have that quite a different perspective. Um, I'm just going to um, now introduce Janet Lawori. Um, from Bees for Development. So again, sorry, again we're, we're running a bit behind time. Um, so Janet, I guess you've got about five minutes if that's all right. But Janet is um, the program manager for Africa for Bees for Development UK. And they're a group who work um, from the UK, but all around the world um, promoting sustainable beekeeping. Um, and she's gonna to talk to us today about the work that their organization is doing. Okay. There we are. Is that Thank all right? You. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. So thank you very much, Tom, and thank you for inviting me to the meeting. My name is Janet. I work for Bees for Development. So we're based in the UK. We're an NGO that promotes beekeeping uh, to combat poverty. And we work in developing countries, and we address and tackle and deal with many different issues around that subject. Um, we, just to give you a, um, a little bit of an introduction, uh, we have uh, community-based projects in particular countries, and at present we're working in Ethiopia, Uganda, and Ghana. So these are sort of focus projects with a particular objective, uh, working with particular communities. Um, in Ethiopia, very much uh, concerned with working with the poorest families and helping them uh, diversify their livelihoods. Um, in Ethiopia, pollen, uh, pollination is important for a number of oilseed crops, but in some of the communities we work, this, the role of pollination is, is poorly understood. Uh, in Uganda, we're promoting a beekeeper-to-beekeeper -beekeeper training model, um, 
and there the uh, a lot of the people who are taking up beekeeping are doing so in order to sell the bee products but also recognize the role of bees in coffee yields uh, and in Ghana, which I'll talk about a little bit more, um, there's a very much greater awareness as a result of some uh, research that's been done on the importance of bees for cashew yields. We also have, in addition to our sort of community-based projects, we also have a knowledge information education program, uh, produce some publications. We've got our website of uh, online library and we send out resource boxes to community groups in different countries. Uh, this is a uh, we, you know, it's our way of reaching more people, if, if you like. Uh, our community based projects are, tend to be quite, um, we can only reach uh, so many people that way. Um, in Ghana, uh, Cashew is a very important uh, and growing uh, uh, cash crop for many small scale, small scale growers. Uh, cashew is very reliant on insect pollination, not, not only the honeybee, but other uh, bees as well. Uh, research has been shown um, that uh, where bees are integrated into cashew orchards, this has uh, a very notable uh, impact on on yields, but in Ghana, um, uh, this research that was done by Dr. Aidu uh, also reported that only about 17% of cashew growers uh, were keeping bees, and he looked at the reasons why they were uh, finding it difficult to incorporate bees into their orchards. Um, and he, so he was looking at uh, how people learnt beekeeping and how they adopted beekeeping and also the, um, the value of the bee products together with the value of the increased uh, cashew nut yields as a result of keeping bees in orchards. And um, he did some, uh, and he produced some results that suggested very significant uh, increase for annual incomes. Uh, for those growers that kept bees in their orchards. And so as a result of that, we've, we've been working with him to uh, develop a beekeeper, uh, beekeeping development project, integrating uh, uh, bees into cashew orchards. So we've been working with um, master beekeepers so that they take the lead of the beekeeping. Because a lot of the cashew growers were saying they didn't know about bees, they didn't know how to handle bees, they weren't, they were nervous about handling bees. Uh, so we've developed this model based on the master beekeeper sighting bees in orchards and uh, gradually going through a process of on the job training, giving training to cashew growers. And uh, just recently, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Aidu, he's uh, He's been working with us to establish a new organization, Bees for Development Ghana. And uh, recently he uh, came to his attention that um, there was a, uh, the government was a, on the brink of launching a, um, a mass spraying exercise of the cashew farms in view with, with the intention of um, addressing uh, some uh, pests. And so he, he, he tackled them on this and uh, pointed out this would be counterproductive in terms of um, uh, having a negative impact uh, on pollinators. Um, and as a result of that, there's, they've reviewed that uh, program and uh, the, uh, the spraying has, is, has now been halted. And, um, <clears throat> but we very, we, working with uh, Dr. Aidu on the uh, cashew and beekeeping integration projects throughout the rest of for the next uh, uh, three years. And I'd also like to draw your attention, if I may, to an event that we're organising in March, a symposium on beekeeping and sustainable development. Thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janet. Um, that was wonderful, and it's, um, it's, I'm glad we've brought in this uh, other side of the importance of pollination, not just the 
copy of, but the the actual um, benefits that people can drive from, from beekeeping itself. Um, so we've now got a, um, a period for some discussion and questions, um, about half an hour, and I'm just going to start. Um, I, well, I want to ask you that you can let you know that you can still keep sending in questions or topics for discussion if you'd like to. And at this point, please can uh, anyone who wants to answer them, um, please just turn on your microphones and and contribute to the discussion. Um, so I'm going to start with a, 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 one of the technical questions that's been sent in, um, and then we can go on to some broader things such as funding and the policy later. But um, I'm going to start with um, a question from Professor Phil Stevenson from Kew Gardens. Um, and I think it's in um, response to Barbara's um, Barbara talking about how pollination should be considered within as just one component in a broader suite of agroecological principles. Um, and Phil Stevenson is asking that should it should it really be considered separately um, from from things like natural pest regulation? Um, because the, some of these, so some he's I think he's agreeing that some of these the things that affect them are the same. Um, but does this combination complicate the narrative too much to to sort of combine all these things together? Um, and making the point that pollination, wild pollination is important for about 75% of the crop. Natural pest regulators are important for about 100%. Um, so I think that's directed to Barbara, but I think anyone can come in. And Phil, if you'd like to clarify that at all, please do so. I, I can, actually. It was, yeah, it was really just to um, ask whether or not we should be considering um, the plight of pollinators in isolation when the approaches and interventions that are meant to reduce harm to pollinators or even uh, augment their populations and diversity are actually the same pretty much for most other beneficial insects. So does, does looking at them separately um, demean the possibility of uh, addressing issues around natural p pest regulators or does putting everything together make the story just too complicated for um, policy makers perhaps to engage with. I don't know which is the right way to do it. So it's which way. I see what you mean. Yeah. And I suppose pollination has served as a really good way of selling the story, a nice simple story, but but as you say it's it's a broader um, series of things. So um so would anyone like to come in on that? Barbara, perhaps you, you I think you you had the same feelings about this and, and um perhaps the the future international pollination initiative will will consider these things together more. Can can you respond to that? Yes, I'll just, just respond um, briefly, and then I'd, I'd be very good to hear from other people and what they think of that. But um, I think I think we can do, we can and we must deal with complexity. I think the future of, of agriculture is going in the direction of diversification, not complication, but complexity and diversity. And I think that's that's an important narrative to put forward. And I also just would ask that people really think how this looks to people on the ground as they're they're, um, they, they may very well understand the narrative about how important pollination is, and I think we should continue with that narrative. It's important, but the measures that they carry out on the ground need to be in a suite of uh, complexity and diversity and not, not single measures. So I'd be interested to hear what other people say. I won't be able to stay with you much longer. Actually. No, that, that's fine. Um, if anyone does want to respond to that as well, please do come in. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next question. Okay, I think I think we'll move on because we haven't got a great deal of time. Um, so we've got. Um, by the way, I should point out that all of these discussions, I would I would really like it if if these can continue on. So if there are any topics that we don't get the chance to explore enough, then please um, contact us or contact other people involved. Um, so and we've had a few questions coming in from um, some researchers in developing countries um, asking what for if they're in a position of being interested in having the, the skills to to do some of this, the stuff that we're all talking about, um, and they they want to access uh, funding or scholarship opportunities or conduct research. Um, what are the, the channels available to them? Because as as we all know, funding is is very limited in these parts of the world. And uh, this is, I guess, a question partly to the, the funding bodies, but also anyone who has experience at this. What what are appropriate channels for um, coming across this funding and and getting yourself linked into a bigger Network where you can where you can access uh, funding and resources. Um, would anyone like to comment upon that? Perhaps anyone from a funding body or um, PN, who I know is is worked a lot with um, developing networks. Uh, 
would just jump in and say that I'm probably not the best person at this point to to comment on funding bodies. I mean, at best, at best is uh, has a function for uh, knowledge generation, but at this stage for pollination, we don't have a direct funding uh, influence. No, that's fine. I, I think I, something that's come up with talking to various people as well is that um, it's very difficult for students from developing countries to, to access UK um, studentships, so PhD projects or masters, access that funding. And, and that the fact that a, maybe a dedicated funding stream which could benefit these sorts of students would, would contribute a lot. Um, from the, the funding, I know we've got um, someone from NERC and BBSRC, Simon and, and Debbie here today. Would you, are you aware of any uh, studentships or any of these sorts of um, the, the programs that we have in this country that are available uh, or targeted at, at those kind of students? If, if no one's coming in on that, we can move on to another, um, another question. Um, so I, I wanted to pick up on something that um, Hien talked about, the, um, the networks that, that she says are so important in terms of um, getting, uh, bringing together uh, academics and uh, practitioners all in the same place. And, and the excellent event that was run, the BestNet Triologue in, um, in Eastern Europe, which I know uh, Pippa was, Pippa Halings was involved with. And I just wonder, what is your, both your experiences of, of these networks? Do they, is it enough just to establish them? And for example, the African Pollinator Initiative, um, or do they need a lot of work to keep them going and, and keeping these people interacting and, and driving things forward? Pippa, can I, are you, can I bring you in on that? Before Pippa yes, um, hey, thank you. <laughs> Hello, yes, um, my name is Pippa Halings, and I'm working with UNDP BESNET. I'm the global facilitator for the trilogues. And so, on one hand, they're capacity building and developing of the networks, and then on the other, they're really dealing with this issue of policy uptake, one at the national level, but also in terms of changes to practice on the ground. And what we specifically looked about at the networks as well is how you bring in, when there's a data poor situation in many of these countries, how you bring in people who do have the indigenous knowledge, the local knowledge um, and the observations, um, what you could call them as citizen science, the beginnings of citizen science through what they're doing on the ground. And this is what the trilogues are designed for. So, three communities. We have policy science, but we're also bringing in the practitioners. And that could be NGOs, the Bees for Development, others like that, or actually um, practitioners on the ground. So the key issue in the Eastern Europe um, trialogue was, one, if we had the slide that looked at the information from the global summary, the thematic summary assessment by IPBES on pollinators, there's virtually no information that came out from Eastern Europe. And Eastern Europe, the countries were being approached to be part of the sign up to the Coalition of the Willing as country um, to the Coalition of the Willing on pollinators. And they'd never ever really been engaged in the science. And when we then looked at, so what was the information coming out of the five countries we're dealing with that was involved in the summary assessment and in the global assessment, it was virtually nothing. We had some things that were coming out of Hungary and Romania, but nothing out of these smaller countries. Um, and then we found that the issue of pollination in policymakers' minds was pollination, honey, beekeepers. And actually, these are not the most important part of our agricultural sector. Um, and nor, should, nor do we really have the time or resources to deal with that very, very tiny sector of our society. So in terms of developing the network, first of all, what we were doing was actually raising that awareness locally and nationally, drawing on the global results to see if that was actually reflected in the trends and the experiences on the ground. And we brought in ministers of agriculture and looked at the EU accession policies um, and farmers and brought in beekeepers too, but we were really looking at the farmers, the private sector experience, and what the agricultural policies were lining up. 
And it was out of that when we looked at it a bit like Barbara said, as a, as a complex situation, but one completely embedded within agriculture, farming, and the plans for e-accession or third-party trade partners. That's where we got the, the, the richness of this. And then we were trialing and looking out through the trialogues the way that people before the trialogue and then immediately following the trialogue, identified the people that they would be interested to continue to be in touch with. And we're following that up three months after the trialogue, and then again six months after the trialogue. And it was very, very interesting to see them looking at who was involved in the trialogue and the researchers that they had access to and the policy makers. Um, and the actions that they were signing up to. As Hien said, we came out with a regional action document which also had national actions. And they saw that in some ways the pollinators don't look at country boundaries. So they're very, very poor um, resources in terms of research and monitoring, but they decided that they would have a regional initiative on hazard monitoring and early warning on pollinators, pathogens, pests, um, contaminants that could, they could share information around something that wasn't happening. That then laid the basis for them, hopefully at the CBD uh, meeting, and also at the IPBES plenary coming up in Co Colombia, where actually we are quite hopeful that those governments would now sign up to the Coalition of the Willing, coming out of that dialogue. And so really that network has come out of practical actions, meeting different people with different bits of knowledge, but also enabling them to improve what they're doing through that network. And yes, it does take more than just having people sign up. It, it actually needs a bit of a motor behind that. And there are many platforms um, that can help that, but it's mainly about how they see the usefulness of that network for them improving policy or action on the ground. Um, thank you, Tom, if that helped. Uh, thank you very much, Pippa. That's, that's really interesting. Um, we're going to keep moving on, I'm afraid, but it's good to bring up these topics to, to think about. Um, so I've got a question now from um, Vicky Morgan, um, ex-director of this, uh, the UK CDS, um, and she's asking what, what evidence is there in the developing world for links between pollinator services and natural non-agricultural -agri habitats? So what is, is there a does natural habitat drive an improvement in pollinator services, or is that link not clearly established? Um, so any academics um, out there, uh, Adam Van Bergen, I believe you might have some thoughts on this, or anyone else? Sure. Who is. Yeah, just uh, it's quite an easy one to respond to that. I think there is quite a lot of um, high quality evidence that um, patches of natural habitat in uh, particularly tropical landscapes have a key role in supplying at least visitation uh, by uh, pollinating insects to crops and there's a there's quite a well established decay function the further away you go from natural areas the more visitation rates fall off so there is an argument to conserving uh, patches of semi natural habitat in the, at the landscape scale in order to uh, try and assure the supply of those uh, beneficial insects I suppose the other side of the coin might be, of course, there may be a trade-off with, uh, in tropical regions, for example, uh, vertebrate pests and invertebrate pests emanating from the same patches. So it's quite an interesting um, avenue of research, really, to look at the balance of services and disservices from um, remnant natural habitats in uh, tropical landscapes, I would suggest. Thanks a lot, Adam. And I know you're um, at CEH about to start some work in Eastern Africa looking at, at these kinds of effects. So that's that's really interesting. Um, and slightly tying in with that, um, I wonder, and, and this again is going out to some of the, the, the funding bodies and the, and the academics, um, there's been, I'm sure you're all aware, there's been some recent changes in the UK funding landscape where more of the official development assistance budget has been made available to directly to universities and academics. For example, through the Global Challenges Research Fund and the Newton Fund. Um, is there a feeling that this, that that um, topics such as ecology and agroecology and pollination fit into this into this framework, um, or is this uh, are you experiencing this, this falling sort of without outside of the realms of that? Um, so I'd really like to, to bring in um, someone from from BBSC or, BBSRC or NERC. Um, Simon Curley, are you are you listening? 
or Debbie Harding. If not, any any academics who've got had any experience with um, feeding to these new these new funding sources um, and how how you feel ecology and specifically pollination is viewed um, by these. I'll, I'll 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 jump in, Tom. It's Adam yeah. Van Bergen again. Sure. Um, uh, I think we're all horizon scanning those opportunities as they present themselves, such as through GCRF. Um, hitherto, though, my impression is that there have been comparatively few calls with an ecological focus and indeed with an explicitly pollinator focus. One exception is recently um, there was the um, SASA call through the BBSRC, I think it was leading that, which is sustainable agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and uh, whilst much of the scope of that call was very much on about improving crop varieties and things, I think there was room therein to sort of add in um, uh, approaches that could be described as sustainable intensification or ecological intensification using beneficial organisms. But um, my anticipation about that call is that it will probably attract the more um, traditional um, agronomic and, and crop breeding focus type proposals. Otherwise, my impression has been that a lot of the calls so far have been focused on other sources of environmental risk, such as um, risks from climatic extremes, for example. I may be wrong, maybe others know better than I. Yeah, do, does anyone else want to comment on that? Um, thanks, Adam. I, I should just um, mention that, uh, so one of the, the people I've been communicating with is um, from the JRS Foundation in the United States, which is a funding body there who fund um, biological research in, in Africa. And actually they've uh, this year put out two specific calls, one for ecology and one for freshwater, sorry, one for pollination, one for freshwater ecology. Um, and um, they mentioned that they would like me to bring that up in this in this webinar, just that that call has been put out for um, pollinator related studies in Africa, particularly building um, data, uh, monitoring programs and data um, on pollination services that can be that will be used when when perhaps governments are willing to engage with that kind of data. Um, but anyway, I just I would like to move on to um, something a little bit more policy related now. Um, so we know that there's, I mean, there is a, a wide body of evidence out there, particularly in, um, in the, develop, the developed world. Um, and there, I mean, there's, there's no doubt there is a lot of um, research being done. But what are the big challenges with incorporating these, this research and, and this sort of evidence into national policy? Because obviously that's the next step, getting, generating recommendations and getting them put into a policy framework. And I know that's something that people are, concerned about is that that final step is lacking, uh, particularly in the developing world. Um, and I'd just like to maybe bring in um, Vin Fleming, Vincent Fleming, who's done some work with um, Substa um, and is based at the J JNCC, um, if you're able to come in. Otherwise, um, Barbara, I know, I don't know if you're still there, but I know you had some thoughts on that as a, as a kind of a big um, stumbling block for, for this sort of work being done, um, how that next step is taken to get stuff, to get research incorporated into a policy framework. Would, any, would anyone like to um, come in on that? I, I know that um, we also have someone from UNDP, Yuko Kurachi, um, who's a policy specialist. Are you listening and willing to come in? No, I believe you're not online. Um, okay, if no one um, is going to comment on that, that's fine. Um, so we'll just go on to another um, more technical question. And again, this is from um, Professor Phil Stevenson. So um, I'll just read this one out. So. It's so detailed knowledge of beneficial insects among the ultimate stakeholders, farmers, who are obviously the people who stand to, to benefit or lose out from this, um, and the extension workers is really poor. So in, in his experience, that, at least in Africa, that those farmers are very unaware of a lot of the, uh, the benefits that, that insects can bring. Um, and this undermines the ability of farmers to understand why they should reduce agricultural inputs 
um, and see wildflowers as anything other than just weeds or cattle fodder. So should knowledge transfer be a higher priority in development initiatives to inform and help support the implementation of action um, that reduces harm to these beneficial insects? Um, and is that a sort of priority? Phil, would you like to just come in and just... Uh, I thought, you did I thought you did an excellent job of reading out my question. <laughs> I've, got, I've got nothing more to add. Okay, that's great. Um, did you want to direct that at anyone in particular? or? I nope. suppose No. Nope. I just, I mean, this is around uh, pollinator and uh, pollinators and development. And as I've already int intimated, I think we should be perhaps considering um, the, the wider biodiversity around um, food production. But uh, yeah, I just wonder, because we, we've talked an awful lot about gathering evidence and information, um, but this is going to take lots of time. And whilst we're doing all of this, um, the harm that we're doing to our landscapes is carrying on regardless. And I just wonder, I mean, I, I've certainly on a Darwin Initiative project have conducted a survey where about 4% of farmers um, recognize the, the concept of a natural enemy, let alone were able to identify any. And with pollinators, uh, it was better, but not much. Uh, and most farmers see all insects as pests. And to me, to my mind, that is really where the problem lies. If you're, if you're effectively telling lots of people who are using pesticides to stop using them because they're harming the environment and the ecosystem and they don't understand what that is, then how can they take up that knowledge and implement it? with uh, any confidence. So I, I just wonder whether that knowledge um, transfer should be much higher on the agenda to uh, implement change sooner rather than later. Yeah, I, certainly. And, I, and it links in with what Barbara said about sort of educating that next generation of extension workers and farmers, sort of the next green revolution, um, educating them in, the, in these ecological intensification. Um, and I know that um, FAO's farmer field schools do um, some work on this where they, they have um, forums in which um, extension workers or, or positive farmers are educated in some of these techniques and lead lo trials with local farmers where they can try some of these techniques in a kind of risk-free environment um, without, the, without perhaps affecting their own crops. Um, and yeah, so I think that's a, that's a sort of very effective technique, but I'm not sure how widely applied that is. Um, I think both, oh, sorry, carry on. Sorry, it was Adam van Bergen here. I was just going to interject. I think I agree completely with Phil's assessment um, of the situation in, in an East African context. However, there are, um, there are uh, networks, outreach networks of different kind run by different organizations throughout the region. But perhaps it's just a question of making sure that our research um, is transmitted more effectively through those. I imagine and I feel that a lot of the messages are current in those extension networks are of a more agronomic nature um, uh, about the management regimes in terms of pesticide use and things like that. So I think there's an opportunity there to try and get some more um, sustainable practices through those existing networks um, in uh, often operated by um, governmental or non-governmental institutions in, in that region. Uh, th yeah, thank you, Adam. Um, I, I've just got a message saying that Colonel Erdley wants to, to come in on that. Would you, can you, um, was that to a previous question? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay, fine, great. Sorry, I didn't know how to come in. Okay, With regards? That's great. So, um, With well, I, I just, uh, I just saw a message saying that you would like to come in on one of the points. Um, it was that yes, the, po the point would be um, government policy. Uh, my experience said government policy is usually restricted. The, the knowledge of government policy is re among a small group of people. But to get among farmers and the general public and general publicity, I think this is the way to actually go ahead with pollinator biodiversity conservation. And it is a very much a growing field. People are starting, well, at least in South Africa, there's a lot of, there's a growing interest in pollination that there wasn't even five years ago. And a lot that stimulates this is photography because people can take nice pictures. It's relatively cheap and with digital is instant gratification. 
And if, but then you need a taxonomy as well because people like to know what they're photographing. And this is, is really quite contagious. Once people get into it, they, they become very um, keen on doing this and, and, and they encourage their friends and farmers, I find, are becoming more and more aware of pollination and um, wanting to include and incorporate pollination. They might not quite know what to do and where they're going, but, but the, the incentive and the knowledge and the will to do something is, is, is definitely increasing in there. And I think that's the, fear, the sphere that we need to move in. I think we'll gain greater results than just concentrating on policy. And I've got a feeling this is what Barbara has as mainstreaming. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Colonel. Um, that's great. I, I've got one more question that's just come in um, for for Sam Myers. If are you still there, Sam? I know Sam had to leave for a meeting. Are you, Sam? Are you around still? No. Okay. Um, I think we better, um, I think Sam's left, um, we better start wrapping it up because that was the, the allocated time for this webinar and I don't want to keep all of you too much longer. Um, but it's, it's been really interesting to, to hear these different perspectives and have a bit of a chance for communication even though it's, it's not ideal doing it on this um, format of a webinar where it's, it's very hard to, to sort of engage with people. But um, it's been very interesting for me and hopefully for a lot of you to hear what's, what's happening. Um, and I know we've, we've, uh, we haven't had a chance to bring in some of the funding bodies and I, I know that um, Debbie Harding from BBSRC wasn't able to turn her microphone on, but she just, I've just had a quick message from her in response to my question about funding. Um, she says that GCRF and Newton span all of the research councils, so in theory these areas would be covered pollination and et cetera, but we'd need to consider pollination along with any other areas and identify what the research challenge would be. So they, they're still, I think, in the process of identifying some of the priority areas. Um, but that's, that, as Adam said, that's a horizon to keep, keep an eye out on. Um, but anyway, so thank you once again to all of the speakers and to everyone for contributing. And I really hope that this, this is really just meant to sort of provide a starting point for getting people talking and, and my report, which is going to be uh, published in the next few weeks, will build upon a lot of these things um, and hopefully again provide a kind of a hub for discussing some of these issues, particularly for those who are less linked into these international networks. Um, and, and hopefully it's also highlighted, most importantly, what pollination can contribute to international development and why, why we should be thinking about it. So thank you, thank you to everyone um, for attending and I hope to see many of you again in the near future.